All right, everybody. I'm really excited to welcome you uh, to a webinar featuring Jason Chin, Fritz Sedlizek, and Justin Zook, uh, really talking about a new benchmark for exploring uh, variants in challenging medically relevant genes. Um, and uh, I know I'm I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but uh, many of you probably work on uh, graphs in challenging regions, and I think bringing these kinds of ideas to the clinic is so exciting. So I'm really glad you're here. Uh, and please interact with us. Go ahead and put stuff in the questions or the chat. And uh, really, hopefully, we'll have time to open this up for a discussion at the end. So I'm Ben Busby. Um, I'm a, a scientific director um, of the research platforms community here at DNA Nexus. Um, I'm joined by Jason Chin, who's a senior director of research here, uh, Justin Zook. Um, who uh, is a biomarker in genomic sciences group leader at NIST. Uh, I've known Justin for a lot of years. That's the first time I've said his title out loud. And Fritz Sedlizek, an associate professor uh, at Baylor College of Medicine, and now uh, somebody also has an adjunct appointment in the Rice Computer Science Department. So congratulations on that, Fritz. Oh, thanks. All right. So. Uh, I work at DNA Nexus, and uh, what do we do here at DNA Nexus? Well, really excitingly, uh, beyond uh, sort of genomic computation, uh, really we also provide a platform for really large-scale data integration of diverse biomedical data, all the way uh, from sort of the traditional genomics uh, you uh, know us for, all the way to proteomics, EMR data, and imaging. And uh, I'd... Uh, Give a shout out. Um, we'll have a webinar in mid-April about viewing uh, image data on uh, various DNA Nexus platforms. So I think that's going to be exciting. Uh, but today we're really going to focus on, uh, it's really going to be a deep dive uh, into uh, sort of hardcore genomics, if you will. Uh, and again, we're going to be talking about uh, medically uh, relevant complex regions of the genome. So first, I'll talk a little bit uh, about sort of um, uh, the GRC and, and sort of the traditional reference genomes, really before I pass the baton to Justin, who's going to talk about uh, really genome in a bottle, what it is, and also uh, why uh, it's important to look in difficult regions. And I, I think the uh, these medically relevant genes uh, underlie this. Um, then uh, we'll talk about uh, this benchmark, medically relevant genes in the benchmark. Fritz will really focus in on that. Um, We'll talk about uh, clinical practice. Uh, I might jump in on that a little bit. And then uh, Jason Chin is really going to uh, sort of mediate the Q&A and the discussion that I'm hoping we'll all have. So really looking forward to that at the end. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, uh, as you all know, around the year 2000, uh, the first human genomes were sequenced, and then a genome reference came to be. And, and really check out the Genome Reference Consortium websites uh, if you want some more information on that. Um, but for one thing, uh, this, this reference genome is really a composite genome coming from a number of individuals. And also, you know, as you all know, we, we, sequence, uh, we sequence individuals uh, with a variety of technologies. And when we do variant calls, um, they can be different with different pipelines. And, and Justin and, and Mark Salad and others really did a lot of seminal work uh, he'll probably touch on extremely briefly, uh, really thinking about which regions uh, 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 were the calls consistent and which regions uh, were the calls very disparate. And, and that'll be sort of the core, I think, of uh, what we're thinking about in the webinar today, certainly not homogenous across the genome. Uh, so now I'm gonna pass uh, the microphone uh, to Justin, who's gonna talk a little bit more specifically about genome in a bottle, and also uh, this particular study. Yeah, so thanks, Ben and Jason and DNA Nexus team for organizing this webinar about the um, paper that we recently published. Um, so, um, so I'll start by giving a little bit of background about what we've been doing in the Genome in a Bottle Consortium over the past um, nine or 10 years. Um, and how we've progressively moved to more and more difficult regions of the genome, including some of these challenging medically relevant genes that we'll talk about today. Um, 
And so as Ben showed in the previous slide, um, there have been a number of studies that have shown that different methods give different results. Um, even sometimes when you're using the same data set, if you analyze it in different ways, you'll get, get discordant results. Um, and this has improved over time, as particularly in the easier regions of the genome. Um, and sometimes uh, the genome is sort of analogized to a puzzle, like I show on the left-hand side here, where there are regions of the puzzle that are quite distinct from each other, and so it's relatively easy to put those together. And then there are other regions, like the leaves or the grass on this puzzle, that look really similar to each other. Um, and these are much harder to put together. And so in the genome, these regions are often very repetitive regions. And, um, and often you'll get different answers if you use different sequencing technologies or use different analysis methods. Um, and so over time, a lot of our work in genome in a bottle has been pushing into these harder and harder regions of the genomes to allow you to understand how accurately you're sequencing those regions and improve your methods in those particular regions. Um, the approach that we've taken to do this is to develop what we call reference materials at NIST. And so these are actual like physical vials of DNA that you can get from NIST where you can run these through your sequencer, run it through your bioinformatics analysis, through variant calling, and compare your variant calls to ours to understand the accuracy of those methods. Um, so um, typically, if you take just a sort of random sample that you're sequencing, you might get a set of variant calls from it, and you won't know whether the, the variants that you get out of it are accurate or false positives, or maybe you're missing some variants. And um, so it's, it's often hard to understand that. And so with these, the idea of these reference materials that you can um, get from the genome in a bottle is that you can run these through your process and then you can see that this variant that you're detecting is correct because it's in our benchmark and maybe this variant is not in our benchmark and and but within our benchmark regions and so it's a, a false positive variant that you've detected. And then you might also have some other variants that are in the benchmark but you don't detect and so those would be false negatives in your method. Uh, the One of the ways that these uh, reference materials and benchmarks that we've developed can be used is to compare different variant calling methods to each other. Um, and DNA Nexus has published a number of nice blogs where they've used our benchmarks to um, compare different variant callers um, on the same data set. And you can see sort of how they're um, recall or precision or sensitivity or specificity compared to each other for SNPs or for indels or for, for different subsets of the genome. Um, and so that, so they've done a number of these comparisons where they took different methods and, um, and you can also look across the different genome in a bottle samples and see how these, these methods compare to each other. Um, so just to briefly go over how we design our um, reference materials uh, benchmarks um, is essentially we have a set of benchmark calls, which are depicted by the pink here intersecting with the purple. Um, and then we also have a set our benchmark regions that we've defined where we're pretty confident we have the right answer, uh, at least for the most part. Um, and the idea is that you can then take your calls and intersect them with ours. Um, and any variants that match should be true positives in your call set. Um, any variants that you miss would be potential false negatives in your call set. Uh, um, and any extra variants that you have that are inside our benchmark regions would be false positives. Um, and we do a, a lot of evaluations of these to make sure that we're accurately identifying false positives and false negatives in, the, in a variety of different call sets. Um, one of the other th important things to note is that there will be variants that you're calling that are outside our benchmark regions um, because we couldn't confidently come up with a benchmark in those regions with our current methods. And so over time, we've been trying to expand these benchmark regions and benchmark variant calls so that you can assess more and more of the variants. And that's part of what we've done in this work. Um, back um, in 2019, uh, in Genome in a Bottle and also in a team in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, we published some resources for easier small variants. So we took all seven of our samples and 
came up with benchmarks for about 85 to 90% of the GRCH37 and GRCH38 reference genomes. We also developed a set of best practices for doing benchmarking where you can compare your calls to ours in a standardized way. And this turns out to be really important in a lot of the, especially in some of the more complex variants in complex regions to, um, to do, because often you'll represent variants in different ways. Um, so, so we published that back in 2019. Um, and one of the things that we looked at is how well do these cover some of the more difficult medically relevant genes that have been characterized in the genome. And we found so in this red line here, this is the fraction of the gene covered um, by the version three benchmark, which was what we published in 2019. And you can see that only 19 out of these 170 or so um, difficult genes were covered greater than 90% by that version three benchmark. So we did a lot of work to use long reads and linked read technologies to improve coverage of difficult genes and got up to about 110 of those genes that are covered greater than 90% by the version four benchmark. Um, but even the version four benchmark was still missing um, quite a number of genes that are known to be medically relevant um, and are difficult to sequence. And so this work was sort of to tackle, do a focused analysis on those particular genes that were missing from that benchmark. Um, so next I'll go through sort of the, the briefly the process that we use to generate this benchmark and uh, welcome to look at our paper to get a deeper understanding of this process. Um, but essentially, we um, came up with a list of medically relevant genes. Um, we looked to see how well our, those genes were covered by our version four benchmark. Um, and then uh, we also looked to see how well these genes were covered by a new um, de novo assembly of the genome um, that, um, that we uh, can call variants from. And, so essentially our, our goal here was to use this de novo assembly based um, technique for creating a benchmark to create a benchmark for the genes that were not covered well by the version four benchmark. Um, and I'll go through some examples of these, these genes, but we did a, a pretty extensive curation of these genes to make sure that we thought they were being resolved accurately by the assembly. Um, both on a large scale and then also looking at particular variants that that um, that might have been errors. And so we um, excluded any errors that we found during this extensive curation process. Um, in the end, we ended up with about 273 medically relevant genes that we included in this new benchmark that were not covered well by the previous benchmark. Um, Sorry. Okay, so next I'll sort of talk about some of the results that we got from this um, new benchmark um, and some of the important genes that we covered just as examples. So many of you may know this gene SMN1, um, which has an associated gene SMN2 um, that is really similar to it. And so th these genes are very hard to sequence, but they're also very medically relevant. So they're associated with uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and there are even now some new treatments that can be given if you're able to diagnose this, uh, this disease early on. Um, and so um, previously, this gene was not very well included in our benchmark. If you look at the blue bars from version four, we only cover a little small section of this, this gene um, in the old benchmark and actually don't have any benchmark variants within these regions. In the new benchmark, which is labeled CMRG here, we cover almost all of the gene um, and a lot of new variants within this gene. And you can see that with standard Illumina-based methods, you get very little coverage across this gene. Um, even with PacBio HiFi long reads, they you sort of get a trailed off coverage here to the left on the left side of the gene. And so, so this gene is quite challenging to sequence. You can see this. Um, dot plot that Jason generated on the left-hand side here that shows that there are really complicated series of repeats around this gene that make it really hard to, um, to characterize for, for even for long reads. 
Um, the other thing that we hadn't really expected to, um, to encounter while we were making this benchmark is that there are a number of errors in GRCH38 um, where there are extra copies of a set of genes. Um, so, um, so instead of having one copy of the gene, there are two copies of the gene that are slightly different from each other. And it turns out that either no one or pretty much no one has two copies of these genes. So it causes um, substantial problems when you're trying to align reads to the GRCH38 reference um, to know which of those gene copies they should go to. And, and often, like you can see with Illumina, here you get very little coverage uh, across the gene, and even the coverage you have is low mapping quality. Um, and even with longer reads, you end up getting a lot of mismapped reads within these genes. Um, so um, what enabled us to discover this is that the assembly-based approach that we used was able to correctly align the, the contigs across this gene. Um, and then we um, worked with the telomere to telomere consortium to look at a large number of other genomes and found that in fact, pretty much no one has these, has two copies of these genes. And so one way to fix this relatively easy on, easily on GRCH38 is to mask out those false duplications so that your reads don't align to the wrong copy. Um, and if you do that, um, you can see that like before doing masking from Illumina, you only get a small number of variant calls and they actually all have the wrong genotype. After doing the masking, you get the same variant calls that we have in our challenging medically relevant gene benchmark. And so in fact, your the the recall for one of the Illumina based call sets that we tested increased from 7% to 100% within these genes after you do masking. Um, we also found in looking at these medically relevant genes that, um, that there are some that likely have collapsed duplications on GRCH38. So this is sort of the, the opposite problem where GRCH38 is missing extra copies of the gene. Um, and we also collaborated with the telomere to telomere consortium in this and found that a number of the genes that we were looking at um, were missing copies. and. Uh, some of these we include in our challenging medically relevant gene benchmark, like this KMT2C and MAP2K3. Um, there are other genes that we couldn't include with our current methods because of this error in the reference, like this KCNJ18 and 12 genes. Um, and just to sort of show the practical use of this new benchmark, um, one of the things that we often do is see like, how do your um, false positive or false negative rates compare for the new benchmark versus the old benchmark if you take your same method on both. And so here we took sort of like a typical Illumina based call set and compared to our version four benchmark and compared to our challenging medically relevant gene benchmark. And you can see that the false negative rate is substantially higher in the the new benchmark because it's identifying a lot more of these difficult false negatives that were um, missing from the, the call set. And this is particularly true like in complex variants in tandem repeats or um, in uh, like low mappability regions and segmental duplications. Um, so just to sort of summarize what we've learned that we've we found that it's really important that we continue to improve these benchmarks over time. This is both because some of our older benchmarks have some errors in them that we didn't uh, didn't find when with the older technologies, but also because this allows us to expand into new regions of the genome that, that are often important clinically to be able to to benchmark your methods. Um, and one of the ways that we've been doing this is using new long read based assembly methods that have really been advancing rapidly recently and enabling characterization of these challenging genome regions and also challenging structural variants. Um, and one of the things I didn't have time to cover today is that we also cover um, about 200 structural variants within these challenging medically relevant genes in this new benchmark that enables you to characterize how well you detect these. Um, there's still a lot more work to be done, and Fritz will talk about this briefly, but particularly for more complex structural variants, and then also for things like tumor genomes where you have more, more complex variants that happen. Um, and I will turn it over to Fritz now. 
Yeah, thanks, Justin. And also thanks to Tiana Nexus for setting up this event and, and working with them together. It's really a blessing. Um, so I wanted to, let me see, yeah, I can advance it. So I wanted to talk also a little bit more about the importance of these genes and, and that being selected and resolved. So like, it's my deep belief, oh, well, actually, so these genes, as you can see on the right side, they impact actually multiple diseases. So like one of the major found, major um, areas that they're impacting is really neurological diseases um, with 15%. Uh, but there are also multiple genes in there that have impact in multiple diseases. And so it is my, my sincere belief that like resolving these genes um, really lead to a better understanding of multiple genetic diseases um, that, that we are so often studying. And so this is the importance of this study because like um, resolving these genes and providing benchmarks into these genes really enables multiple laboratories not just to routinely discover the variants in these genes and then improve our associations with diseases, but furthermore also um, enables the application and the development of novel computational um, methodologies to enable these discoveries in these genes. Um, but also, as Justin pointed out, we also identified like errors in the reference and we could identify them and, and resolve them and also show how they improve um, the mapping and the, and the SMD and structure variant calling across these genes. So altogether, I think it's really important to highlight that these um, benchmarks in genome model are not just like a theoretical excursion of, of like you can identify and, and quantify the functionality of your pipeline of clinical institutes or, or research institutes, but also that they, that they really improve the development on the bioinformatics and computational biology side. So with that, um, there were a couple of challenges left as, as uh, Justin already alluded. So actually we just, had, we just uh, left on the plate, so to speak, 122 medical relevant genes. And the interesting part of these 122 are that we, well, we could resolve them and, and we think we got them right over the HIFI based assembly. However, we are currently lacking benchmark tools or, or, or standards on how to describe these variants. And I have this little cartoon here on the right side where it's like simplified, but basically as you can think about, and this is coming the next slide, as you can think about um, there are multiple genes that are so complex that you can represent the diversity in multiple ways. And so it's really hard to kind of just describe it in one way and then compare different descriptions to this way that you describe it. And as I alluded already a little bit towards uh, on the previous slide, I think this really opens up the avenue of new technology developments to resolve these complexities better in terms of sequencing space, in terms of new panel designs, in terms of um, new, new um, array data, maybe even. Um, and then as well as on the tool design, the capabilities of identifying variants, for example, on the, on the Dragon side with Illumina or the variant side with Google. But what is also important and one, one of which I think Genome Bottle is pushing nicely is the importance of phasing of these variants also in these genes, which allows us a better interpretation of the impact of these variants being at SNVs or structure variants altogether, and, and therefore also improving our understanding of the impact of the variants uh, for particular human diseases. And so um, just to give you an example, I don't know if, yeah, thanks. Um, one, one of the genes that I'm very in, particularly interested in, and, and sadly we, we could resolve it, but like we couldn't include it in the benchmark because it's so complex, is the gene LPA. So LPA is a gene that includes multiple copy number variants. So you see that on the top right here, um, where you see this uh, red, blue, red, blue, and, and so on. This is a 5.5 is a KP repeat unit um, that is repeated like 10 to 50 or more times in individuals and have a high, diversity in the human population of numbers of repeats that you would see. And so like we could represent uh, SNVs and copy numbers of these regions based on our HIFI based assembly. However, as you can imagine, there are multiple ways to report these mutations and therefore benchmark these mutations because you have so many tandem, um, uh, tandem duplications in one row. You can report them as tandem duplications. You can report them as simple copy number variants can also report them as large insertions co compared to the reference genome. In any ways, this gene is super important and interesting for me because like it's directly related um, 
to the cardiovascular disease risk. Um, and so identifying the copy number of this RIP is super important as for example, the Washington Post just put out a, uh, a nice article about it. I highlight that on the lower left. And so what we are currently also trying to do together with Jason Chin from DNA Nexus is kind of resolve this kind of complex region over a graph genome-based approach. And that is what I'm showing here on the bottom right. So you can read this as like the main, uh, the main haplotype across the population is the most thickest line in this graph. And then you can see diversion, divergency uh, across this uh, copy number region with everything aligned. So every thin line represents a mutation or a variant or SND or multiple SNDs um, of that individual or multiple individuals to the reference genome. And actually what we are doing with this is not just showing that the copy number counts, but actually it also shows an, uh, an unknown, really unknown um, level of mutations and diversity in these copy regions. And we are currently exploring uh, uh, opportunities on how to see which of these mutations are really impactful for this important gene. Um, so, but coming back to the actual topic for today, and I don't know if I should present this or Ben, uh, sorry about that, um, is the clinical applications for these um, benchmarks and clinical applications um, for the general gene model bottle. And so uh, we really think how this uh, benchmark is going to be leveraged is the creation of current clinical and research pipelines. So you can think about that clinical laboratories uh, could take this benchmark and report back to clinicians on how good or bad they are doing in these um, regions and therefore give clinicians a better oversight and overview of which kind of re, uh, clinical panel or research panel or pipelines, uh, which level of accuracy they can promise. Or, um, uh, and then furthermore, of course, what we are using it, for example, inside of, of the HTSC is for validation of our sequence instruments as well as pipelines, um, where we have just of today, we are also onboarding like a couple of Illumina sequencers. And so we are going to probably run HTC02 on it and using Chino on the bottle to validate that the instruments are working as promised and, and as, as we can use them and include them in our production. Um, you can also think about developing of novel assays to assess and resolve certain challenges, gene low size uh, using this kind of benchmark. Um, and we are thinking of this avenue as well as many others, obviously, um, since these genes are highly relevant. And then, of course, uh, it's one of one of Ben's favorite topic, as I also alluded in the last slide, is the how how much we can utilize already graph genomes, or how can we bring graph genomes closer to a clinical uh, diagnosis um, and go away from HG19, uh, maybe even skip GRCH38 for that reason, and really have a better representation of the population of the uh, or different ethnicities in one reference, um, and this would improve potentially also the identification of, of critical variants. Um, yeah, and I think with that, I'm, I'm heading it back to Ben. Uh, thanks, Fritz. Um, and, and I will uh, say that actually credit for this uh, figure goes to uh, Jason, uh, who built it a number of years ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I would also say that I think one thing that's, that's really exciting about thinking about graphs like this are uh, what Eric Garrison might call toxic paths through graphs. And so uh, thinking about uh, being able to do mapping um, until you hit a toxic path um, and, and being able to leverage that uh, specifically in the clinic, I think is, is really exciting. Um, that said, um, uh, we'd like to thank a lot of people. Uh, they're really uh, just a, a huge number of centers um, and uh, and, and organizations um, that that really uh, that that really supported this, and, and hopefully, um, as uh, uh, Jason uh, or sorry Justin alluded to uh, at the very beginning, um, there uh, there may be a genome in a bottle meeting um, later this year, and, and I encourage you if if you're really interested in this kind of stuff to to think about attending. It's it's a really eye opening event, and uh, it's really interesting to get together with people. Uh, that you know, and and also uh, just as a shameless plug, Fritz and I, uh, we we typically run an annual uh, structural variance in graph genomes hackathon, um, and uh, that that will likely be taking place in October 22, uh, whether virtual, in person, or hybrid. So yeah, we uh, hope in person, but like there will also be a remote component, obviously. Yeah. So.
Uh, great. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Jason Chin, uh, who's going to moderate uh, the, the Q&A, um, as well as uh, thanks to Jason for, for doing a lot of the science behind the scenes, as well as doing a lot of the, the running of this webinar behind the scenes. So. Thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, I'd like to thank Justin Fries uh, for this uh, great collaboration and a lot of other colleagues in DNX is also DNX for this. Uh, There's a couple of questions already raised up in the chat room. Uh, so the first one is for Mana. I think Justin, you already addressed that, but uh, I think other um, other other participants might be also interested in answer. Will you be able to like uh, repeat that question and uh, just say what your answer will be? Yeah, so Mana was asking if um, how to mask out the falsely duplicated regions in GRCH38 and whether there were existing resources for that. Um, and we do, I put a link in the chat for the um, the masked version that, that we last created for GRCH38. So you can use that FASTA file. Um, Mana actually has a follow-up that, um, that NCBI updated this bed file and has a couple extra contamination uh, regions that that are not masked in that um, version two, and that you can just use a Picard tool to to mask whatever version of GRCH38 you prefer to use with their bed file, and that should get similar results to what we have. Um, and we may also release release a new version um, that will include those contaminated ma maskings in the near future. Great. Um, Phillips Richman asked about, do you plan to help in benchmark state spanning multiple global populations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so many of you Probably those of you who are familiar with Genome Vitabot will know that we have the NA1278 genome, who's of European ancestry. We have a trio from the Personal Genome Project that's of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, and we have another trio that's of Han Chinese ancestry right now. And those are the seven samples that we've um, currently characterized within Genome in a Bottle. Uh, one of the collaborations that we've had recently is with the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium, where they are doing de novo assemblies of a large number of diverse individuals. Um, and I think one of our paths to, um, to making future benchmarks for different ancestry groups is using some of the results from the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium. And we've started to do some exploratory work along those lines, but um, but it will probably take us a little bit of time to, um, to develop the methods for doing that. Okay. Um, so then the uh, next one question will be uh, from uh, Pei Ming Huang. Uh, say, do you provide the CMV copy number variation true set for the NIST control? Uh, so right now we have deletions. Um, so we have copy number loss um, benchmarks. We sort of have a like duplication uh, benchmark in the sense that we have some some insertions that are labeled as tandem duplications. And so you can use that as a sort of like provisional duplication truth set, but, to be like honest, we this is something that's still on our to-do list to sort of figure out how to best provide CMV truth sets. Um, one of the challenges is like how you even define what a CMV is and like how identical do the copies need to be. And um, especially when you start to move into like segmental duplications that are copy number variant, it becomes quite complicated to think about what a CMV actually is. Um, and, and so, um, so this is something that we know is like important to the community and we'd, we'd like to sort of, sort of do more work along these lines in the, the near future, but don't have much there yet. Yeah, I think uh, this is a touch base on the freeze uh, to, um, um, uh, presentation about the, the LPS star. So freeze, do you have any comment about that? Yeah, I mean like for the, for the LPA directly, it's very tricky. Um, and there are not really good copy number callers out there just because the repeat unit is just too large um, to have like high mapping quality in these regions uh, compared to GRCH 38 and 37. 
Um, um, I mean, like this, this is obviously something that I always like to push Justin about to have more rearrangements and more copy numbers uh, in this in this control benchmark sets, but it's obviously very tricky and I've, I've, we are working on that direction, obviously, together. Okay, thanks. Uh, There's one more question for uh, Hiren or Hiren, sorry, I probably pronounce, don't pronounce your name right. Uh, is there a leaf over utility that we can use for the mas masked version of the GRC 38 to transform our variant result. I don't know who will be the best answer this uh, for this. Um, please, you have the floor now. Why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like this is something we are actually working on actively also together with Justin. So one of my postdoc is actually designing a tool right now that takes a BAM file that is mapped to the original 38 reference genome. And basically within five to 10 minutes on a single thread corrects these mappings um, and realigns these regions. And so provides a corrected version of that BEM file or CREM file. And we are currently in the works of writing up this manuscript um, and providing this method in hopefully the near future. Yeah, Fris, you have additional comment on this? Um, Additional? Uh, oh, sorry, Justice. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> no. yeah. No, I, I just 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 to like concretely answer the question. I, I don't think it's possible to lift over these variants. You have to do something like what Fritz was just describing, where you at least like locally remap these regions. Yeah. Just just to explain, because like in the current, so like in the current mapping that you maybe have on thirty eight, for example. The mapping quality in these regions are absolutely zero. And so like you will not have variant cause in these regions. And so with that tool that I just mentioned, uh, you get mapping quality of 60 or so in these regions. And so therefore you enable variant calling again. So uh, I'll come to uh, another one more question. Well, two more questions, one from Lemuel and the Philip, I will follow up on your question later. So uh, Lemuel, uh, I think it asked about uh, have you found mapping discrepancy with structural variations annotated in database like DGV? I'm not quite sure what that is, but uh, maybe <laughs> we can clarify that. For the, for example, with the new benchmark version. So Ben, can you uh, pass that to um, let me also to, to know what DGV is. I, I don't really know that. Maybe she, he or she can ask question directly. Unless Justin, you know that, but I, I don't know about it. So. I, th I think it's like, I think it's like a database of structural okay. variants um, that's either at yeah. NCBI or EBI. I forget actually, I think it might be at EBI maybe. Um, yeah, okay. structural database. That's what I should say. Um, I know, Fritz, you've looked some at these databases and how they represent variants. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, we haven't looked very deep. Um, I've, we, we clearly saw an impact of these regions that Justin described or we described in this paper also on Knomad SV and, and general Knomad. Um, so I would imagine that um, that database is also affected in these regions. Yeah. So uh, Ben, go ahead. Oh, I was going to mention that uh, Fritz and I have been collaborating with uh, Ahmad Al Khalifa at, uh, and many, many others. Um, uh, he's at King's College London, and we have many other collaborators working on something called GeneVar. Uh, and I should right. call out Tim Heffernan as well. Uh, so DBVAR is the NCBI version of uh, sort of a database of uh, structural variants. And uh, we have a shiny app for genic regions um, in there, which uh, we think tend to be uh, clinically relevant. So uh, there's a shiny app out there called uh, GeneVar, which uh, we've worked on with many collaborators and, and hope to be publishing on soon. Yep. Um, the next question, we've got a couple more questions. I think we have a little more time. I think all these are great questions. I think uh, it will be uh, good to know uh, what you guys think about that. So. Philip begs another question. Is the recommend, recommendation to use hard max to ENS, you know, the N in a faster file, faster sequence, or so max lowercase reference faster for this false duplication? Assume mapping pipeline BWA mem to D variant. So I, I have some thought about that, but I want to see like freeze or 
um, Justin would like to start first. Um, uh, so like in our benchmarks, we just hard mask them with ends. That's the short answer. Yeah, yeah we haven't tested the soft masking. I'm not actually sure how different tools handle soft masking. Uh, if, if they ignore the soft mask regions, then I think it would work fine, but I'm not sure what BWAMM does with soft masked. Yeah. I think, uh, yes, that, that depends on the tool, right? So I, I, I think BWMN doesn't really distinguish the upper case and lower case. So in our case, probably the hard mask is better or using the um, band files, sorry, band file to mask, then that's better, yeah. All right, uh, I think uh, we just have one more question. Uh, or oh, there are more, <laughs> okay. Uh, Kimberly Walker asked about freeze touch on um, graph-like references and their need in a clinical setting. Are there tools or resources you can recommend? I think, well, actually, I think I passed this back to you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think uh, I, I can try to answer that. Uh, and uh, I, I think right now, it's uh, the graph-based uh, development. It's very active in research area. Uh, I think Ben already touched, like Eric Garrison, and a lot of people in the T2T consortium has the algorithm expertise to develop that. Um, uh, we also do a little work here. And uh, I think that probably will take a while to, to, to get to something like you, when people do either a man or mapping have sold like a difficult standard. Um, and especially like that's why the work that Fritz talk about that is very important because that, that help us to say, to lead that method to say there's indeed utility that help the downstream user uh, clinical lab or even medical data to understand how, what that means to them. So I will say be patient, but uh, you'll be some exciting work uh, coming out in a couple months or years. <laughs> yeah. the, the only thing I want to extend is like the, the graph based, like we are often thinking of the most extreme version, like for example, what we showed in the LPA case um, that Jason and I are working on or like what Jason just mentioned, but like what is also good to mention is TRCH38 itself with all the alternative contexts is actually one representation of a graph genome that simply includes multiple representations of multiple loci. And the other thing about to mention is like in a, a middle step almost, or like a really far along step between the most extreme case and the 38 is, the, is what Dragon Illumina is basically using, I think right now in their reference representation. All right, uh, there are two more questions and I think our time is probably okay. So I, I think uh, one is just comment from uh, email, sorry, sorry, I pronounced the name, I don't pronounce the name right. It would be great to see ACMG adopt your benchmark uh, guidelines. I think, uh, Justin, that's your, you have to help to push it out. <laughs> 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 and it will help you too, okay? Yeah, if anyone has connections in uh, the groups that are working on that at ACMG, we're happy to, to talk more with them. Yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, I think Brian, Brian Brandon Wick, Welk uh, asked about had this work been assessed against the synthetic variation of difficult region developed by the sequencing quality control phase two, uh, QC2 consortium that was published in January. If so, uh, if so, any finding of none, uh, there's a link there. Um, so uh, I think Justin can just cover this, right? I think the, the answer is we don't have a really direct look into that yet, but uh, you, you know the work there. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. We haven't done any direct comparison to that yet, um, but yeah, it would be interesting to see how many of the same genes they looked at in that work, and I haven't done that yet. Yeah. Um, I see there's one other question about whether this is only available for HG002 right now. And yes, it is only available for HG002. Our plans for um, future benchmarks for other genomes um, is probably to move to like adopting this approach, but doing it on a whole genome scale rather than focusing just on medically relevant genes so that um, so that we'll be using like assembly-based benchmarks for, for multiple samples um, 
within genome in a bottle and maybe even from like the human pan genome reference consortium like what we talked about earlier so um so i think that we're moving towards more of like a whole genome based approach which will also hopefully cover most of these medically relevant genes that we discussed in this paper but a lot of what we learned here is really helping with sort of developing those methods yeah so I say this multiple times. This is the last question. There's one more question for you, for you guys. So I think this is the last one. And uh, by the way, Justin Freeze and uh, Ben and I will be available for answer more questions. You can find us. Uh, just if it's not answered uh, in this uh, in this webinar. Just a final final question. Uh, sorry, I missed that. This is from Sharisha. Is there? And any effort to consolidate uh, reference standard with GDC, uh, we have been closely followed the GF or GH, uh, GF or GH standards. So may maybe I'll, I'll just uh, kind of take my point of view first, right? So uh, the the one one reference genome for GRC thirty A, I think uh, the NCBI have been building a standard for that, and uh, Justin. I think you work with GFGH also closely, right? So, but right now I don't think it's not a direct uh, link there yet in my understanding. And uh, there can be a little more complication because uh, like in the future there are part of more reference can, gener can be generated from the T2T um, work. So that's kind of, maybe it's uh, important to have all people work together and see how we deal with the the um, the the world that uh, the genomics analysis beyond just sing one single references in the next couple of years. Um, Justin and Fritz, you have anything to comment on this? Yeah, I guess I one of the things um, to note is that there are there are lots of different meanings of the word standard and reference in the genomics field and. I, my understanding of what the genomic data commons is working on is more on the sort of data formatting standards. Um, and we tend to be more focused on developing like truth sets or like benchmarks that people can compare against. And I think these are complementary to each other. And certainly like having our data represented consistently with existing standards is important, but we do tend to um, sort of fulfill different roles within the community. Raise anything more? About no, it? I'm just echoing what Justin said. I think those two are complementary. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I really enjoyed the discussion section. I, I feel there's uh, many, many interesting questions and uh, the discussion of uh, and the opinion from uh, thought and from Justin Fries is super valuable for this uh, 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 webinar. And someone asked uh, this webinar will be recorded um, or not. I think uh, Ben already answered that. You'll be recorded, redisputed. So uh, if you have any thought about that uh, after watching it or share with your colleague, please do. And uh, if you have any thought about that, you know the email for the publication, you can always ping us. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll hand the floor back to Ben to conclude. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and really for a great and active discussion. I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I do a fair amount of webinars and having 80 people hang on and uh, uh, think about a complex topic with us and, and really engage in a discussion. It, it really makes me uh, excited that um, uh, maybe that'll shift uh, Jason's uh, curve of graph tools from the year's uh, uh, reality to the month's reality. And so, uh, and I, I hope you all are, are working on this actively. So, uh, and, and I know many of you are, so thanks. Thanks for being involved. And uh, yeah, we, we hope to see you next time. If you wanna see more webinars like this from DNA Nexus, let us know, uh, you know, uh, drop us a line and, and uh, we'd be happy to, to work out uh, uh, more webinars like this. And so thanks again to uh, uh, Jason and uh, and Fritz and Justin, and uh, we'll see you all next, as well as the, the marketing team here at DNA Nexus. Um, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.